This is Leslie Gordon. I'm executive director of the Bremen Jewish Heritage Museum, and I'm thrilled to be here live at the Bremen. We may be closed, but there's a handful of us here, and uh, of course, our star of the hour, Herschel Greenblatt. I'm thrilled to welcome you to our first virtual Bearing Witness presentation. I want in particular to thank the Rich Foundation for support and for our community partner, Hemshech. We have lots of amazing things going on at the Bremen, and even though you can't come through the doors, you can find us 24-7 at thebremen.org. We have virtual exhibitions. We have all kinds of games and interesting things posted, and if you've missed any of the wonderful programs we've done, they're actually on our website, thebremen.org. So I want to thank everyone for signing in today. We're thrilled to do this. You will be getting a survey sometime after this program. Please fill it out. Our funders love to know what you think, and we love to know what you think. So now, before we get started, I just want to say one more word that this is all put together beautifully by Rabbi Joe Prass and his team at the Weinberg Center, Michelle Langer, and Jennifer Reed. So now please welcome Rabbi Pratt. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you. And I want to welcome everyone um, from across the city and actually from across the country. I understand that we have people um, from near and far here for our speaker, Herschel Greenblatt, today. Um, I'm going to let Herschel's story speak for itself. Just a little bit of housekeeping uh, for those of you who are tuning in. Um, I want to reiterate how important it is to hear from our survivor community. Um, and today you will hear an amazing story of Herschel Greenblatt. Herschel's story um, will be shared with you in the form of a movie. Um, for those of you who are watching, if you're on Wi-Fi, um, we, we hope that you will enjoy it as much as everyone who is wired in. Um, the movie will be about 35 minutes. We have the opportunity to have question and answers at the end. And so what we're asking is in the bottom of the uh, uh, box or the bottom of the Zoom window, that if you have questions as they go along, uh, that you type them in to us and we here at the museum will uh, do our best to uh, compile them and ask Herschel those questions um, at the very end. Um, I wanna thank you for taking some of your Sunday afternoon uh, to be part of this very important program. And so now uh, on with our show, the story of Herschel Green. My name is Grisha Greenblatt. I was born April the 24th, 1941. I was actually born inside a cave uh, outside of Kiev, a part of the uh, pre cave system. I can't fathom, you know, my parents living in there and actually having a small child, uh, three or four months old, uh, with them. My father Abraham Greenblatt was born in Lublin, Poland in December of 1919. He was uh, the youngest of uh, 16 children. The other 15 of his siblings were all girls. Uh, his father was a uh, very uh, religious member of the uh, synagogue there in Lublin. Um, he was uh, a kind of a caretaker. Uh, they called it a shamus uh, in, uh, in the synagogue. War. Precisely at dawn on September 1st, without warning, the German Wehrmacht ruled over the Polish border. When Hitler invaded uh, Poland at 18, 19 years old, he uh, became part of a group of resistance fighters uh, in the ghetto of Lublin. My father, as a, as a resistance fighter, uh, participated in uh, underground activities such as blowing up convoys or trying to fight off Nazi intrusion into the synagogue. One afternoon, he did come home and his mother told him that the uh, SS group uh, had come to uh, asking for him, wanting to know where he was and what his activities were. So his mother told him that, you know, he, he had to leave, he had to get out of town. So this is when he, uh, he and uh, 10 or 12 of his friends uh, escaped across the border 
uh, from Poland into the Ukraine. At that time, he joined up with a, another a group of resistance fighters in the Ukraine that were fighting the Nazis when the Nazis invaded the Ukraine in 1940 and 41. His family were all taken to a concentration camp outside of Lublin called Madonic, and in that camp they were uh, gassed and put into the ovens of uh, Madonic. My father uh, met up with uh, my mother in this particular group. They met, I guess, uh, in, in one of their meetings. That was in, in late 1939. They uh, fell in love and were married uh, in August of 1940. On June the 22nd, 1941, the success-crazy Nazis took their longest step toward world conquest. Without any declaration of war, they blitzed into Russia. The Germans that invaded Russia, they were bound and determined to round up every possible Jew in the Ukraine. There was over a million Jews, and they had a big concentration of Jewish population in the Ukraine. This is where Jews had lived for centuries. They were, you know, doctors and lawyers, and 95% uh, of their Jews were being rounded up, taken to the killing fields. concentration camps there yet. They didn't have the ovens yet. So they just took Jews you know, arbitrarily out of their homes, dragged them out of their homes, and took them to these fields, made them dig their own graves, made them dig the ditches, and uh, lined them up. And they were shot in the back of the head. And as they fell into the ditch, the, uh, the graves that they dug, uh, then another group was lined up, and they basically uh, fell on top of them. Just because they were Jews, they were rounded up and taken to these killing fields and shot in the back of the head like they were animals. The area of uh, Ukraine where my parents lived, there is a large area of subterranean underground caves called the pre Grotto Caves. Very, very large caverns, miles and miles long. My father knew of the caves, and a lot of people uh, now really don't know how resourceful some people that survived knew that there were caves, that there were areas where hundreds and hundreds of Jews actually hid. Some of them hid for two or three years uh, under there. They came out at night and to, to get food from locals. And a lot of the locals, uh, you know, when they killed some of their livestock, would kind of dump those uh, into the entrance of the caves. So there was. Um, it was an area where, you know, the resourcefulness came in and these are how these people were saved. Life in, under the, in the caves, there were separate rooms, separate areas where people would be able to sleep and, uh, and then areas where they would cook. There was plenty of water, there was, there was lakes, there were fresh water under there, so there was plenty of water under there. The temperatures there was in the in the 50s. It was fairly easy to live there. It was very very dark. They said they uh, they actually slept during during the day and cooked it at night and went out at night. The life was very very hard. As an infant, I, my mother said I, I slept most of the time and uh, I guess got used to the, to the darkness. Uh, I did get sick, had uh, some you know dysentery, and uh, at one time she used the phrase diphtheria. I you know and, and tell me uh, how you know how my life was. Um, she said a lot of times as as I was growing up, she told me she didn't think that. I would survive, uh, survive in, in the caves. Um, she said that I was born in a very inopportune time. Our existence mainly was uh, inside the caves. My father was determined that they were not going to be captured. 
in, in order to get back into the cave, you actually had to go in feet first. And they had a safe word. They had a, a word that you had to say. And if you didn't know that word, they would take a, a machete or a big knife and just cut your legs off. And so uh, they, didn't, they didn't ask questions. If you didn't know the word, you weren't going to get in. They uh, confronted German convoys and uh, were able to do some damage to the Germans. The injury to my mother was, I guess, the catalyst to kind of get us out of the caves. Uh, one evening, as they were in a uh, middle of a skirmish with, uh, with German soldiers, uh, she was wounded in the upper part of her right leg in, in the thigh area and uh, uh, needed to be received medical attention almost immediately. This is where my mother, uh, where my father decided that he was going to leave the cave and uh, take her to get her medical attention. Uh, and he told his friends that were in the cave that he was going to leave me with them and let them take care of me. And that, you know, hopefully when they returned and they, he promised that he would return, that I would still be there. The length of time that they left me there, I believe, was um, eight to ten weeks. Uh, when they uh, when they came back, my mother still had, uh, she said she still had uh, bandages uh, and uh, was walking with a uh, kind of a cane that they made out of a, uh, a large uh, stick. And um, so when they came back, I was still there. I was very ill, she said, but I was still there. The reason that my mother and father had to leave the cave and had to leave the group was uh, to get her further medical attention. They felt that they needed to get out of the, the area where the Germans were, and they went further uh, east into uh, a town called Krasnow on the Sea of Azor uh, in Russia, where she was actually in, in a hospital approximately uh, two or three months. Um, the, that's where my father left his resistance uh, fighting. Uh, he took a job in a bakery that was run by the uh, Russian police, and uh, he made the mistake of uh, trying to bring some bread home to us and was caught by the Russian police and put into a uh, prison camp. While my father was in prison, my mother was actually lived in a farmhouse with a, a, a Russian family. Um, and I guess was uh, was getting better. She worked as a seamstress, I know, and as I remember, a little outfit that she made for me that looked like a checkerboard. So I, I know that uh, she worked as a seamstress, and then my father was released a little over a year later. After he got out of prison, uh, I guess my mother at that time got pregnant with my sister Anne, and she was born in Krasnow. realized uh, very, very early uh, after the war ended, late summer of 1945, that life under communism was not going to be any better for Jews than life, uh, possibly even worse than, than life, you know, under the Nazis, if that, you know, could have been worse. But this is when my father and, you know, a number of his friends decided to make the trek across Russia. Uh, I mean, that, that was a... 1800 mile trip they made their plans they bought the uh, the train they bought off an engineer and actually had, were able to get uh, two cattle cars and about 20 families crammed into those two cattle cars on that train ride uh, again it was very 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 cramped I still remember the the smell I mean you know human beings living that cramped together my sister became very ill she had a lot of stomach problems dysentery that type of thing she cried constantly and my parents were told that if they couldn't get her to quiet down because it you know, if when they got to a post where they were Russian, Russian police, uh, you know, if they hurt her or whatever, we would, you know, we would be stopped and sent back. Uh, so thankfully, my sister was able to be quieted down. The trip took about eight to ten weeks. Uh, it was uh, th there were times when we would be standing still for days at a time because they knew what was ahead and they, they knew how to make sure that they were not captured. What we ate basically was things that they were able to get from farmers on the way. I know there was a lot of uh, beets, potatoes, and they would cook potato soup, and that was about it. There was very little um, 
There was no meat or anything, it was just uh, a lot of vegetables. Our main uh, goal was to get across the border into the American zone of Austria, into uh, an area around Salzburg, uh, where the American government had set up displaced persons camps uh, called DP camps. And uh, we arrived at one of these camps very late that winter um, in the middle of the night. The first camp that we got to was a camp called Beth Bialik. It was a converted German uh, army camp. There was dozens and dozens of barracks, very, very long barracks. I mean, they had to be, you know, 150, 200 feet long. There was no separation inside the barrack. Each family was taken to a specific barrack and said, this is where you're going to be. And we were given blankets, and uh, the blankets were mainly used to hang around on strings around an area. And each family kind of became squatters. We, we took a a specific area of that barrack, and that's that's where we, we lived for the next uh, year. We slept on the floors uh, and uh, of the barracks. Uh, uh, some some people had uh, you know thin mattresses. Some people didn't. And a vivid memory of the uh, rats that ran around in the middle of the night. That they would be at our feet or running around you know over our head. Or uh, so it was uh, it was not very very pleasant. Eventually, we were moved to another displaced persons camp about uh, 18 miles from there uh, called Beth Israel in a little small town called Haline. The conditions in the second camp was uh, almost like a resort area. Uh, we actually had our own room. The rooms were, I would say, about 8 by 10, and each room did have a window, no furniture. We. We, you know, slept on the floor, but the, the conditions were a lot cleaner. This is a camp that was cleaned up and uh, was made uh, livable uh, by the American uh, Army. Uh, Ethel was actually born when we first got to Camp Haline. My sister Ethel was born in a hospital in Salzburg, Austria. My father became very resourceful in this camp. This is where he finally got control of everything. He and some of his buddies uh, became very active in a, I would say it's a black market uh, where they would buy cigarettes off American soldiers. They would buy canned goods, whatever they, they could you know, buy and uh, resell. This is how he made his living. He became very, very good at it. He would go out and um, do what he had to do. He was able to make enough money. Uh, he was one of the first uh, of the uh, people in the camp that actually bought a stove and put it inside the room and uh, put a chimney out, out the window. And uh, my mother could actually boil water uh, for not for cooking, but uh, mainly for bathing and. Um, so we would, uh, we would all be able to take a bath and uh, of course it was all one little room and uh, my mother took us you know, one at a time in, in a large laundry tub. I would bathe first and then, then my sister uh, would bathe and then my little sister Ethel would bathe and, and then they, put us, they would put us to, to bed uh, up against the wall and we had to turn around and face the wall where my mother and my father could, could bathe also. Living in the displaced persons camp, we, as children, there was hundreds of us. We had the freedom that we wanted. We were able to play. We were able to just have fun. The camp became more a, a community of, uh, of people getting together and recreating the, the lives that they had before the war. You know, if you were a baker, you opened up your own little bake shop. You baked your, the challah, you baked your traditional Jewish breads. If you were a, a shoemaker, you opened up your, your own shoe shop. There was, there were, there was, a, there was flower shops, there was uh, vegetable shops. Teachers were, became teachers. It was a Jewish life. We were, we were able to celebrate. We were, we were able to, you know, on Saturday morning, hear the uh, Sabbath services, go to Sabbath services. Uh, you could you could hear the cantors. The, uh, you could hear them outside of the synagogue. It was peaceful. You know, it was uh, it was it was something that was needed at the time for these people because the previous five years was you know hell. I think the only real thing I knew about America was Notre Dame. 
One of the soldiers, when I lived in the, uh, in, in, at, at uh, Beth, Beth uh, Israel, one of the soldiers had, uh, had gone to Notre Dame and he would make sure that I knew all about Notre Dame and uh, what a great school. I actually think uh, I knew how to sing the Notre Dame fight song. In the middle of November of 1950, we crossed the North Atlantic on our way to, uh, to America. We were out at sea about 12 days, and uh, my father woke me up early when, when he came down and woke me up. And um, it was very late, it was, you know, dark, and, uh, and, I, and he just said that he needed to take me up on deck. Uh, that I need, there was something that he wanted me to see. And he did take me up on deck and um, very, very beautifully lit up and uh, in all her glory was the Statue of Liberty. First time I'd ever seen skyscrapers and I'm standing at the rail, just my father and I just standing there at the rail with, you know, all the other people that had gotten up early. Uh, and, and, watch this, and watch the Statue of Liberty. I had a feeling of, um, wow, you know, this is, this is going to, this, this is something new, this is something that's going to be good for me. And uh, uh, I felt a sense of uh, anxiety and I felt a sense that uh, what else was, was going to happen next. In the, all the years that I did not, you know, that I didn't know my father, before that and after that, that was the, the only time that uh, my father held my hand. My father was not one of those tender, loving type of people. He was a disciplinarian, excellent father, but you know, he was very reserved and he actually held my hand in his first, first time and the only time I think I, that I saw my father actually cry. He was. And uh, it was, it was, I just felt that it was something that was going to, again, the anticipation and that uh, what was to come next. All aboard. All aboard. Leaving New York, you travel that, that whole afternoon and into the night. The uh, porter, who was uh, very, very nice and that morning tried to feed us uh, breakfast of uh, bacon and eggs and of course we didn't we weren't going to be eating the bacon or anything but he was very very nice and he was able to get us off the train late that night uh, or really almost into the morning uh, into Washington DC and took us off the train and just left us there here we are standing in the middle of Union Station in Washington DC uh, my, my father, who speaks no English, my mother speaks no English, and the only English word I knew was pencil, and my two little sisters. So we're, we're standing there, we have no idea where to go. My father's got all his papers in his hand and his brown bag. This was the night before Thanksgiving. We were standing in the station, and a few feet away from us was a small group of American soldiers. Uh, I'm assuming they were on their way uh, home for Thanksgiving and one of the young soldiers walked over to us and uh, introduced himself. He was able to actually speak to us in Yiddish, which is, you know, the language that most European Jews spoke at the time. My father was able to converse with him and he took our papers and saw where we had to go, saw what train we had to board and, and before he put us on the train, uh, he had a large bag of tangerines, and he took a tangerine out of his bag for each one of us. I had a lot of firsts those first two days in America, and he also went in his pocket and um, took out three brand new 50 cent pieces, and he gave us each a, uh, a 50 cent piece. To this day, I still carry mine with me. I, it never, really never leaves me. Uh, my wife uh, finds it sometimes for me when I misplace it at home, but when I'm at it, it never leaves me. Just to remind me of the kindness of, of the American soldiers, the kindness that not only of this particular soldier, but the soldiers that took care of us uh, the five years, you know, before that uh, to make our lives, you know, 
a, a little bit better uh, living, you know, in the camps. Uh, Mrs. Gowasser took uh, took me and my sister um, Ann by the hand and walked us about three and a half blocks down down Capitol Avenue uh, to James L. Key Elementary School. Uh, I remember the principal, uh, a uh, Mrs. Cates. Uh, welcomed us, welcomed us at the door, and took us in the office and uh, filled out all kinds of uh, paperwork. And that's where Russia became Herschel. Whether it was legally or not, they changed. They actually changed uh, my name from Grisha to Herschel. Uh, I was uh, put into the uh, third grade, uh, and I was very, very lucky that the teacher in that third grade was. Uh, a young uh, teacher, I think her first year teaching, uh, happens to, happened to be Jewish, uh, and uh, you know took me by the hand and made me feel welcome. And she spoke to me and she says, "You're an American. You're going to learn how to speak English now. No more Yiddish. Uh, no more Polish." My relationship with the kids uh, with, in my in my class was was phenomenal. They were all. They were all great. Uh, there were some that uh, questioned, you know, my clothing and, and, the way, and the way I looked, but eventually I started wearing blue jeans and t-shirts and became as American, you know, playing baseball. And I learned, I learned very, very quickly. It was in a neighborhood, a ghetto, black ghetto neighborhood. Uh, called Buttermilk Bottom. This is where he started his business life. Uh, he was there for many, many, many years. My father became part of that community. He would uh, give you know food on credit. Uh, he had what they called the book, and they would come in and say, "Just put it in the book." And every you know every weekend. Uh, the, the people in the neighborhood would come in and pay off their bill of food that they bought the week before. A small, uh, small boy, about eight or ten years old, came into his store one afternoon and tried to steal uh, a piece of fruit. This was like in the first couple of weeks that my father was there, and uh, my father stopped him and, you know, uh, inquired of him that why he was trying to steal. And the boy said, "Well, he was hungry and didn't have the money to buy it." So. My father told him, you know, just, if you're hungry, just just come in and ask me. I'll be more than happy to make a sandwich for you or whatever whatever you need. Walks into my father's store and introduces himself, and um, they became uh, close friends, and uh, they had a long companionship. It was actually Dr. Martin Luther King, and it was a very interesting relationship that was there. And I think my father told Dr. King more about his uh, uh, life uh, during the war than he told, you know, his family told us. I remember very vividly the day that Dr. King was uh, was shot and the turmoil that was going on in the uh, black areas of the city uh, was, you know, very, very scary. And uh, my mother told my dad, you know, not to go open the store at all, you know, uh, for a few days after. My dad said, no, you know, so he went and uh, people came into the store and talked to him and cried with him. And my father was uh, uh, a very close friend of Dr. King's. My whole life, as far as making a living, was was in sales, uh, high-end furniture sales. My wife and I had uh, two children, uh, Jeff and Jacob. They both married, and uh, now I'm the uh, grandfather of uh, four of the most fantastic grandchildren you could ever need. One and a half million Jewish children were murdered because they were Jews. If we don't tell our stories, it will be forgotten. My story, my father's story, is one of resistance, uh, one of courage.
He knew what happened to his families, and he felt that he didn't want that to happen to him, his wife, and his children. We were very fortunate to not be put into a concentration camp. We were very fortunate by his resourcefulness to get out of Russia, to get to Austria, to get to the United States. I need for people to know the kindness, the, the thoughtfulness of the American soldiers, the American uh, people that I was in contact with, not only at the, in the displaced persons camp, but also when we got to the United States, uh, the teachers, uh, the, uh, the other families that, you know, that embraced us and took us in. I have to let people know Jewish people in uh, World War II were not forgotten. I just want to convey that. I want to convey my thanks uh, um, to, to America. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Herschel Greenblatt. Good afternoon. Herschel, we are um, going to now invite members of the community to ask questions. And so if you are watching this important broadcast, if you have a question, you can type it into the chat function or the Q&A function, and we will gather those questions and ask those of Herschel here. Herschel, we're going to begin with a first question. Um, that today, especially during this period of quarantine, you hear a lot about resiliency. And it's a, it's a buzzword these days, and it's a very important word these days. If you could take just a minute to talk about how you saw your father and your mother demonstrate resiliency, um, both immediately after the war and the time in the DP camps, as well as when you came to America. I know it's a big question, maybe just a couple highlights about mom and dad's resiliency. Well, the resiliency, not only on their part, was to stay alive. The resiliency of all the people that survived, the resiliency of boarding a couple of cattle cars for six to eight weeks, Across, across communist Russia, knowing that if you were caught, you'd be killed probably. Coming to the DP camps, trying to make a life for ourselves, trying to become normal. It was a, a way of becoming normal. My father found a way to make a living and so did everyone else, but everyone helped each other. So the Shabbat services, the Friday night services, the walk across the compound to the synagogue, knowing that I wasn't going to be hurt. Coming to the United States, crossing the Atlantic as an eight year old, I had no idea what was in front of me, but I had the feeling that my mother, my father were there for us. We came to the United States and with the help of the Jewish community, with the help of the Atlanta Jewish Welfare Federation, we got what we needed. My father got a job. And when he couldn't work at that job any longer, his boss, uh, Mr. Max London, Mr. Sidney Feldman, helped my father get 
money for a grocery store where he helped. So that was, that was it. The resiliency to become normal, not only by my own parents who had lost everyone, but dozens of Jewish families who had lost everyone were resilient enough to make a life. And now every one of us are part of a community. Thank you so much. Um, a couple of people have asked, have you ever gone back to visit the places your family lived during the war or do you have any desire to go and visit those places? Uh, I have never, I, the desire, yes. I have the desire to go back maybe to Austria and see, you know, where for five years I grew up and, uh, and had a peaceful existence of a, of a young boy going to, you know, going to uh, Hebrew school. Uh, that is a desire. Going back to the Ukraine, I don't know so much. I did have the opportunity, thankfully, very thankfully, by the help of some of my classmates uh, in, at Henry Grady High School and some of my friends in 2016. My wife and I did have the opportunity to go to Israel and I met up with some of my family, some my mother's family that did go to Israel and was, was shown the most beautiful country, the most beautiful people I have ever had the pleasure to meet. And, uh, you know, uh, with the help of uh, Rabbi Levenberg at Temple Sinai, uh, who was, I guess, our, our host, that was one of the most beautiful trips. So I did have the opportunity to go to Israel, uh, but that, that's about it. Uh, do I want to go back to Austria and, and visit Salzburg and Hallein? Yes, I'd like to at some point. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, it is, your film mentions how your family was sponsored in, um, in Atlanta by the Jewish Federation. And uh, some people wonder, how was your family found? How were they connected with in the Atlanta Jewish Federation and the other people that you mentioned? What was the, the process like? The, pro the exact process, to be honest with you, how the connection was, I don't know. I know that uh, we were met at the train station uh, by a member of um, uh, the Atlanta Jewish Welfare Federation, uh, Dr. Rosen, who was uh, uh, part and uh, uh, the lady that was our sponsor, uh, Mickey Eisenberg, uh, helped us and the families, Mr. and Mrs. Gowasser, the, the family we lived with, uh, the, the Altman family that, that helped us. Um, uh, of course, Mr. Feldman, uh, Mr. London, and my wonderful, my wonderful third grade teacher, uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Mrs. Zaglin, who is right, thankfully still with us, and I still see her. She's in her 90s. Without her, I don't think I'd even be standing here talking to her. Uh, she put me on the path of uh, being a, uh, a scared little boy uh, to someone who understood, taught me American history, taught me how to read and write. So to her, if her family is listening, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, the Jewish Welfare Federation put us in, in a way, put us on, on a path of, of normality. We, uh, they helped us. I know, I remember the day that uh, my father became a citizen. Uh, Mrs. I, Mrs. Eisenberg, Mickey Eisenberg actually drove my father to register to vote. So it, it was, it's, it's, it was a, a community, not only by the Federation, but Jewish families in Atlanta, not only helped us, but also helped other families that came over at that same time. And I'm now, of course, a, a member of, of Hemshech, um, the society that uh, has a memorial out of Greenwood. At least we have now a place that my parents put together with other families that we can say cottage for our families and uh, so it's a 
It's a Jewish community that, that put us together as a whole. Beautiful, thank you. Um, we have a couple from, from some young people, so I'm gonna change tack a little bit. Um, and uh, just two from, uh, one we have from uh, Milo, who's nine years old. And, uh, and he wants to know, um, and it's wonderful that a nine-year-old was watching uh, this program as well, I think we both agree, yes. that do you still love tangerines? And as well, did you ever work in your dad's grocery store? Uh, oh, did I? Uh, my, my father was one that, uh, this, this was a family thing. Uh, uh, after school on Friday, I got on a number six bus and went to my father's store and helped him until he closed Friday night. And uh, sometimes on Saturday I would go, yes, I helped my father and so did my sisters. Uh, and so did my mother and so did my little brother when he was old enough. Uh, and uh, we all became part of that community. Uh, we had a lot of friends. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, I, I played the stickball uh, out on Fort Street uh, uh, with uh, a, a lot of the you know, young African-American children. We, we were friends, we knew each other. We, uh, it was a community. My father owned that business till, till 19, almost 1970. So uh, tangerines, if you go to my house right now and look at the vegetable bin, I think there's a couple of dozen tangerines there. I'll be glad to share with you. Uh, when we go to Costco, my wife says, don't forget the tangerines. Very good. You'll, you'll share after. Uh... We're all a little more healthy and safer. Very good. I'm going to stick with questions from some young people. Um, again, from uh, from a young person, Lucy, who is 11 years old. What did it feel like to go from hiding in the Ukraine to living in the neighborhoods of Atlanta? <laughs> hiding in Ukraine from one day to the next. Uh, as a child, I had my parents were protecting me. Uh, hiding uh, from day to day you didn't know if you got caught you would you know you'd be killed if you were if uh, I mean my father was in prison for you know stealing a cup a couple of loaves of bread uh, life was scary but in the DP camps it was e a lot easier because of the uh, because of the, of the American soldiers I remember very vividly the night that our train pulled in and, uh, you know, everybody now, I hope you're all kind of wearing masks, but I remember looking down and soldiers were wearing their gas masks because the stench, the total outcry of uh, people uh, off that trains uh, it was awful. I mean, you know, uh, almost 200 people on, on two cattle cars for six to eight weeks. Uh, it was terrifying. But coming to the United States, I, I had neighbors. We had uh, we had our our you know our, we had our weenie roast. We had our uh, you know we played stickball. We played baseball. School was school was was wonderful. Uh, uh, the, the number of friends I have to this day, uh, Henry Grady High School in downtown Atlanta, uh, and that I am so proud. I mean, that's, that class of mine in 1960 produced uh, doctors, lawyers, ambassadors. So life was to totally, 180 degree difference. Uh, I was able to have a bar mitzvah. I was one of the first of the immigrant children to have a bar mitzvah. I was one of the first to get married. And the the companionship of that group that that put together a way of us being together. Uh, I can't thank them enough. And 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 hopefully that. Uh, uh, I, I just wish that America felt that way about each other now, the way they felt about each other uh, when I first came to the United States. Beautiful, thank you. Um, two questions, we have a couple, but I'm gonna put two to you from the uh, 
uh, from the time of the cave? Uh, one, I know the answer to, but I think there are some people who are curious. Um, there was a film we saw some years ago called No Place on Earth, based on the story of the families who survived living in the caves for several years. Was your experience living in the caves related or something entirely separate? Uh, yeah, that movie, No Place on Earth, about the Sturmer family, uh, was actually in the priest grotto caves. To be very honest, I have no idea where the cave was that near where, where I was born. Uh, it was very, very similar. You, you hid, you tried to get food, you tried to survive. And that's what the Sturmer family did. They survived. And, but thousands and thousands of others survived in different ways. And six million didn't survive. Uh, so uh, I'll, uh, I'll quote uh, Elie Wiesel, who said, we are now their messengers. It is our job now to tell their stories that they are not forgotten. Life was miserable in the caves in that area. I was a very young child. I remember very little. My memories go in, in the DP camps, but we survived. And uh, of course, now it's, I feel my job to educate and tell because if we don't, if we forget, it's, Six million lives are in vain. Thank you. Thank you. Um, sticking with the caves for just a moment, there are a few questions about that. When your parents did return to the caves for you, um, and, and again, I, um, without being incredibly specific, but about how much longer did you, your family stay in the caves when they returned? Uh, we stayed uh, maybe just a few days because my mother was wounded very badly I mean, to the point where she almost lost her legs. I'm, my father had to get us out of that area. That's why we decided to leave because my mother and my father were not gonna be of any help to anybody. Uh, we were gonna be more of a hindrance, so we had to leave. We left fairly quickly uh, and, and left for, went even further east into the uh, area, a uh, town called Krasnow. Uh, it took us months and months to, to make that trip. It's not a long trip, but it took us a long time. And then when we got to that area, we were able to be hidden. Uh, okay. My father was in prison, but my mother uh, uh, not only took care of me, but my little sister. Uh, my memories of the caves is very, very little. All I know is that, uh, you know, every time my mother got mad at me as I was growing up, she said, I should have left you in that cave. So maybe that wasn't a very nice place. Thank you. Thank you. Um, moving the story forward a little bit. Um, can you tell us what your memories of the boat ride and coming to America uh, were like, specifically on the, on the boat ride? I don't okay, think well, we had a lot of information. That was, uh, that was the USS General Bilal. Uh, we left uh, out of Bremenhofen, Germany. Um, it's an, it's an American transport ship, an army transport ship, uh, by no means a luxury liner. The weather conditions were terrible. We were out there about eight to 10 days. And uh, it, uh, my, I was so seasick. And uh, my father was able to actually uh, show his resilience. He got a job in the commissary of the ship so I had places, you know, I, we had food, but just I don't know how much of it we were able to keep down, but uh, it, uh, it was a very, very hard trip because of, because of the weather. I mean, uh, it, uh, but we were taken care of, uh, and of course, very vividly that night when my father took me up on deck and I got to see the Statue of Liberty uh, for years, I knew what, what she meant. Uh, hopefully, she'll, she's there for a long, 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 long time, welcoming people to the United States to become citizens, like I became. 
Beautiful. Thank you. Um, from an Atlanta resident, an old time Atlanta resident, where in Atlanta was your dad's store? What what okay. street was it on, actually? All right. My father's store was off of Forest Avenue, uh, which is about uh, two or three blocks uh, south of uh, Atlanta Medical Center and right near where uh, the Civic Center, I believe, is already closed in that area. Uh, it was called Buttermilk Bottom because the area smelled like sour milk all the time. And the living conditions were un unbearable. Uh, the living conditions for in the in the 50s and 60s in the city of Atlanta and other cities in the South for the black community was unbearable. Uh, but that's where my father's store was. It wasn't very big. It was small. Uh, my father opened up at six o'clock in the morning, closed about six or seven o'clock at night. Uh, he became part of the community and uh, I became part of the community because I, I was there almost all the time. Uh, uh, I feel my father did his part to pay it forward, to help feed. People couldn't afford it. No, if you can't afford it, we'll put it on the book when you get paid. But that's that's how it is. But I, my father's family, we were not the only ones. There were hundreds, dozens of uh, uh, immigrant, uh, the, the greenest that we came over at the time had grocery stores and helped to feed the, the community. So, but yeah, it, it was right there in the middle of Midtown Atlanta. By the way, now there's some beautiful uh, townhomes there and uh, very near Martin Luther King uh, Center. Uh, so it, uh, but back in the fifties, place was awful. Thank you. Um, are your other siblings alive? Uh, we, we see them in the film, but, uh, what can you tell us of your other siblings? Uh, my sister, Ann, uh, lives in Philadelphia with, uh, uh, near her son, David and, uh, Chrissy. They have a, um, uh, a granddaughter, Liliana, and so she lives in Philadelphia. She's still alive. My uh, my middle sister Ethel uh, did pass away from breast cancer many years ago, uh, and uh, her, uh, my niece Michelle and uh, Harold, uh, they live in the Atlanta area. My my brother uh, George lives in Atlanta in Tucker, Georgia. Uh, he and his wife, and uh, they have two sons, and uh, uh, he has uh, one uh, beautiful, great, uh, beautiful grandson, so they're still alive, and uh, so my brother lives here, my sister Ann lives in Philadelphia. Thank you. We have just about two minutes left, so uh, what I'd like to ask Hirsch was the final question is, you speak, uh, when we are not on a quarantine situation, to thousands and thousands of children. Um, and adults alike. Is there a message you want people to walk away from hearing your story? What is something you want to make sure people know? Okay, when I speak to children, I, I don't love to, you know, to relive the atrocities of what happened to my father's family, my mother's family, to six million other Jews because of hatred. The message that I want to get across, especially the school children, is it happened. It happened because of hatred. You have to learn not to hate. You have to learn not to be a bully. You have to learn how to get along with people. You have to respect each other. Respect your parents, like my parents saved me. Respect your teachers because they're the ones that want you to grow up like decent human beings and respect yourselves. Don't be a bully. But the main thing, and I'll say it again, Ellie Wiesel said it, we have to be the messengers. We cannot forget them. It never happened where a person would actually stand up and have to say, Kaddish, a warned prayer for himself. 
knowing that in the next few minutes he was going to be killed. So we have to remember, we have to be the messengers for the six million that perished. Thank you, Herschel. I want to thank you, Herschel, on behalf of not just the Bremen Museum, but I want to thank you on behalf of all of the hundreds of individuals who are watching today. Um, to all of our guests who are watching uh, this afternoon, um, we convey your thanks for taking some time out of your afternoon. Um, we hope that you will complete the survey that you will be receiving so that we can receive feedback and make important programs like this available to you in the future. Uh, we hope that you'll also visit the Bremen website at thebremen.org and look for other uh, important programs about Jewish arts and culture. And lastly, the uh, Vimeo of this uh, program will be available. Some of you have asked, can I share this important story with other family members that will be making this available? Look to our website for how you can find this uh, and other survivor stories um, on our Vimeo page. Herschel, thank you so much and thank you to all of our audience for attending today. Thank you very much, thank you.